tonight to basically get people recognizing each other and to, to help me understand the priorities of the group, uh, we'll do what we always do, which is basically just go around quickly and you can say who you are or some identifier and, if, and say, you know, what your particular slant or hope or interest is or profession or anything just to, so I can tell, you know, how many art historians, how many shrinks, how many this, how many that, and what the focus of interest is, whether it's all psychedelic or it's about time or, uh, you know, prehistory or whatever. So why don't we just start and by a sort of random process make our way around well, that's worth talking about. I mean, one thing that needs to be made clear if we're going to talk about psychedelic experiences is there are all kinds of altered states. I mean, who knows how many there are. Uh, nitrous states, ketamine states, meditative states, post-orgasmic states, all these states... Uh, I'm particularly interested in what's called the psychedelic experience. It's, it's something which is pretty chemically confined. It's confined to these indoles, uh, psilocybin, ibogaine, LSD, DMT, beta-carbolines, indole hallucinogens. And one thing that is a problem when you talk about this is a lot of people think that they have psychedelic experience when in fact they've only just shaved the undertummy of the beast and all all state all drug states all stimulatory drug states in their uh, initial presentation pre present themselves the same way as speed as rushing thoughts as a kind of euphoria and giddiness. But the, the, that's why I, I stress the defining dose, meaning a sufficient dose of a psychedelic that you see what they do that no other thing does. And what they do is a fairly profound deconstruction of, uh, of all constructions. <laughs> One of the thing, one of the categories of effect, is what's called boundary dissolution. They profoundly dissolve boundaries. I mean, uh, between yourself and the stone you're sitting on, or yourself and somebody else, or yourself and traumatic material in your own past. And this boundary dissolution thing is a very sensitive issue with human beings, because. Uh, identity is maintenance of boundary and yet yes we are our clothes we are who we say we are and yet because of our sexual drive which is a drive toward boundary dissolution we have this weird ambivalence about boundary dissolution we also understand that death is boundary dissolution so is sleep so we're surrounded by this possibility that happens in a waking state in psychedelics in a fairly profound way. The other thing that happens that I stress, that some people say I overstress, but it's just my personal epistemological uh, bias, uh, is vision. That there, it's not enough to have rushing thoughts. It's not enough to have strange feelings. It's not enough to recover childhood memories. It's not enough to conceive of wild schemes. There has to be a point where the uh, upwelling of creativity actually pushes over into the visual cortex. And that, to my mind is the distinguishing characteristic, is when you see it. And this is the first thing, if somebody wants to tell me an experience, the first thing I ask is, did you hallucinate? And even making sure that the person understands the question is not easy, because even in the realm of hallucination, there's a gradient. 
you know, there's uh, phosphenes. We all know what those are. I mean, that's what you see when you press on your eyelids and, or you stand up suddenly and you see rushing green and yellow lights, phosphenes. There's also what's called hypnagogia, uh, dancing mice, little candies, small wheels, string beans, pebbles, all these things in marching endless array, emotionally neutral but visually discernible. And then there is content which becomes progressively less and less Englishable until finally, you know, you're, you are in the presence of something that is somehow fully itself and yet beyond rational apprehension and yet present. And that, to my mind, is, uh, is the payoff. And, and then the name of the game is to watch your mind as over and over again you drop it like a, like a, a depth gauge or something into this deeper and deeper medium where it always deconstructs in the same way or in the generally the same way. And then in the core of all this deconstructing, hopefully, and in the substances I prefer, there is a core observer that is never wiped out, never destroyed, never compromised, and that's the recorder who is taking the film that is going to later be developed and whatever good comes out of this is then going to be brought back. And, uh, you know, someone over here mentioned art and creativity. Uh, psychedelics as catalysts for creativity. This is precisely what they are, both culturally and individually. What they do is they cause a catalysis of the imagination. Well, the imagination is the thumbprint of, of uh, deity, not to put too fine a point on it, on our species. In other words, it is the part of ourselves that is most mysterious, most potentially interpretable as transcendent. And yet, you know, the paradox of materialism is that chemicals, substances, drugs impinge on this most uh, evanescent, spiritual, transcendent, and somehow uh, highly valued portion of the self. Well, then, then, then what does that mean about the nature of mind and the nature of cognition and where being stands in the order of things? You know, what is the mind and what is its place in nature? And I don't pretend to have answers. I just pretend to have the method. And the method is to perturb the mind in the same way that physics perturbs the atom in order to understand its constituent parts. You have to pump energy into the system and then cause its boundaries to rupture and then study the phenomena that result from that. The mind is similar. It's like a mirrored surface. It's perfectly still. As long as you don't perturb it, it will give back a perfect reflection of your expectation. But if you perturb it, then its own nature somehow comes into being. And, uh, you know, this psychedelic thing operates on two levels in my mind. Uh, first of all, it's this old, old, old touchstone of mystery that is linked to our humanness, to our sexuality, to our uh, creativity, to our language, all of these things. And in the course of the weekend, this will all be teased out. But these parts of ourselves are somehow in that, out of that. And then the other side is that there is a kind of uh, urgency, a kind of pregnancy about this issue because our crisis as a global culture is in fact a crisis of insufficient consciousness, insufficient awareness, insufficient love, insufficient feeling. So, you know, we, don't ha we only have two methods supposed to impact on this problem. One is called religion, the other is called ecstatic drugs, plants. And religion has failed. Religion has had the game to itself for 
5,000 years in the West. And this is no joke. Uh, you know, the culture is in crisis, and it's a planetary culture. There is very little doubt but that the neck, the choke point of the next 5,000 years of history lies in the next 50 years. What I mean by that is that we are going to get the correct managerial techniques, social policies, and attitudes in place, or we're going to go extinct in the, in the, in the next little while. Psychedelics, by, by melting assumptions, by destroying the uh, expectations of rigid educations, creates a fluidity of possibility that may allow answers to emerge. And uh, it's the only thing that I've seen that operates on the time scale sufficiently short to have an impact. In other words, we are not getting a handle on our problems. There's very little sign of a deceleration of the lethal tendencies in our society. I don't know how it would be done. One of the things worth talking about is, uh, you know, are there practical, understandable schemes for halting what is happening to our species and the earth? Well, so then, but then, you know, there's a larger question, which is, is history a kind of gestation? Is it no more to be concerned that we're using up all this stuff than that a fetal life in the womb eventually uses up all the stuff and it initiates a crisis? Then, you know, there's strangulation, toxification, earthquakes, collapse, and it turns out this is how it's done and everything is carried into a new dimension and uh, unfolds at a different level. Is it, and this is an interesting question because I don't think you can have it both ways. It's either that the earth is our home and we are to become its gardeners and there is no salvation anywhere but here and we, like that, right? Or the earth is not our home, we are strangers in this universe, we belong in a higher and hidden realm made of light which we will achieve through a monolithic Faustian technical something or other. It's the old Gnostic uh, two-step, you know. Where do you, where do you come down on that? And the, in a sense, the deck is stacked in favor of the Gnostic point of view because we've been playing a Gnostic game for a couple of thousand years. I mean, Christianity, don't let them kid you, all they did was exterminate <clears throat> the competition. But it's a thoroughgoing dualism. I mean, it's as thoroughgoing as all the dualisms it was so enthusiastic to stomp out. Well, because Western civilization is apocalyptically wired for self-destruction. It doesn't have any open, steady-state model of itself. It always builds toward Ragnarok for... Well, I think you glimpse it. This whole psychedelic thing, I think, is the... the Raison d'etre is not the chaos of the experience, which is orgasmic, delightful, transcendental, but the honing of the mind that goes on so that when you come down, you see it all very differently and you see it rather more like an author. You understand that people are characters. You understand... <laughs> that motivation matters. You understand that timing matters. And you understand that there are two kinds of people, those who understand what's going on and those who are being manipulated by those who understand what's going on. Yeah. Well, I'd like to believe they unconceal something, that we're not what they show you is, that you're not the victim of physics. You're not the victim of, that this is not a universe of laws that you are somehow a citizen of, that it's... What laws it, now? What well, like the law of gravity, the law of anything. That it is, that is all a fiction. That what it really is, is some kind of... This is what I was trying to get back to about the plot. It's a story. It's some kind of a story. 
and the, your job then is to awaken to this fact and then to, to, to using that knowledge, I mean, I... To play the role that you Well, and to transform it. To see yourself as a character rather than a victim <laughs> of laws. You are not a victim of laws. You are a character inside a work of art. And given the right... Well, there is a way, basically, to make your dreams come true, I think. And it's nothing more than a slight forward lean into the energy field. And then... Uh, it works. That's all it is. Oh, yes. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, will do to swell a scene, start a procession, advise the prince, careful, meticulous, at times a bit ridiculous. I'm not sure that's absolutely apropos, but it's, yes. The group rock thought that it was a play, but he just accepted his... That's place. right. He saw that he saw that it was a play, but then he he said he was an attendant lord. And I think, you know, people say, well then once you see that it's a play, then you can transform your character. True to a point, but more importantly, I think the real wisdom in all of this is to become the author. Yeah, it's Elliot. You know, the author can reach back in and uh, and choreograph and lead the thing and redeem not only his character but all the characters and to make of life something plotted because left to itself you know as it says in Finnegan's Wake we flop on the seamy side here in Moy Kane we flop on the seamy side but attention coax it into art and that's why intelligence is indispensable to good art. You know, this idea of the enfant terrible, I'm not buying this. You know, intelligence is the indispensable handmaiden of art because it's somehow consciousness itself, consciousness of the how of the way things unfold. Well, anyway, we have our own value system, you know. I mean, Marcello Facino said, man... And he meant by that humanity. Man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. It's not what God wants or the earth wants. Or uh, The only point of view which makes sense for us is a human point of view. Obviously, uh, you know, the earth has achieved great things outside the human realm. But within the human realm, you know, uh, Mozart and Bach and Milton and Rumi and all of this stuff has been achieved and it represents an epigenetic accomplishment. The, it is not part of the gene swarm of the planet that stretches from viruses through to the mammals. It is something else, something some people, the materialists say, an iridescence on matter. But what an iridescence? I mean, I think the human enterprise is and I will argue that it's central to the cosmic drama, that we are not witnesses to nature. <laughs> That's not what it is. That the, what Christianity suppressed was a sense of uh, invocative magic as the human relationship to the world. History is a kind of alchemical sublimation it's a rarefaction and a distillation of something. And, you know, people say, well, you know, what's the argument for the transcendent, for the eminence of the transcendent? The argument for the eminence of the transcendent is the presence of human history on the planet. If it were a planet of groundhogs, butterflies, and reindeer herds, Darwinian mechanics and so forth would nicely take care of the situation. The fact that it is home to the striving of a, of a civilized, idea-producing species means that, the, that nature is trying to birth itself in a new way, almost to epigenetically explode itself out of the, the very deep and um, highly inertial creode of, of ordinary organic existence. And... 
Yeah, that biology, the slow, endless march of biology, you know, 1.4 billion years of biology, and suddenly self-reflection appears, and in a million years produces more change than had been seen in the previous billion years. An order of several magnitudes of compression of time, of compression of novelty, takes place here, and the human world is the domain of that drama. Yeah. No, well, I think human history is an incredibly brief, unstable uh, kind of metamorphosis. It's like, you know, you have caterpillars and then they form a chrysalis and then every enzyme system in this organic system goes berserk and essentially the thing melts. And when it is recast, it emerges as an entirely different kind of creature. History is not some meaningless or existentially empty process that has escaped from the bridal of nature. That's preposterous. It is simply uh, a natural process of a very unusual kind that occurs in a social species with a given density of neurons, a, di a given sophistication of language, and so forth and so on. And then the innate creativity that is locked in matter that causes, uh, you know, uh, electrons and protons to congregate into atoms, that causes atoms to congregate into molecules, that causes molecules to congregate into long chain polymers. This endless um, self transcending through new forms of order that takes place at every level in nature is when it happens in animal nature it bubbles over into self-reflecting consciousness, which is a strategy for time binding. That's basically binding. So language is a, is a strategy for binding time. It says, remember last week when we saw the reindeer by... like that. Uh, and then writing is a further time binding, and then electronic media is an effort to actually stop the fading of time at all and to create a kind of nunc stands, a, a, an endlessly expanding, electronically stabilized now where all data is suspended in some kind of super space of accessibility. Time binding, now happening epigenetically through our species. The thing about history that I don't believe, that I don't see how the rationalists can believe, is that it can be extrapolated endlessly into the future. It can't even be extrapolated hundreds of years into the future. It is obviously a rate-limiting process of some sort that is forcing everything into a situation where only more and more radical perturbation can break it out of this self-canceling cycle that it's into. So, like the birth process and like the death process, it is now irreversible. So, wherever we're going, we are going. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, know you know, where, where are we going and can we, uh, can we make some sense about it? Well, and the other thing is that biology works biology works. It's very successful. It's been around more than a billion years. Civilization doesn't work. It's been around 10,000 years and it's on the brink of meltdown. So this attention to nature is, a, is an effort to study something which works and then organize yourself like that, you know. Uh, and if that could be done, if we could make that intellectual leap, uh, there might be a certain measure of hope. At least that's one of the pieces of the puzzle, you know, to be able to produce things with low temperature catalytic chemistry that doesn't require high temperature and high pressure, which is how it's now done in, in modern industrial fabrication processes. In all of nature on this planet, organic nature, you don't get temperatures much above 130 degrees, and yet redwood trees are produced, coral reefs are produced, at low temperature, at low pressure, uh, yes, everything, yeah. Originally from this planet, but somehow something else put us here, and that we belong into this other realm that we're trying to get to. Well, not so much that. I mean, you don't have to evoke ex extraterrestrials. It's just that, you know, is the Earth some kind of ultimate value? 
to be preserved or is it no more to be preserved than say a placenta uh -huh. this is the question is it is it the baby or is it the placenta well, you, you, that's going what is humanity's role on the earth? Are we a fetus or are we a cancer? That's right. <laughs> That's right. But saying we're a cancer is, you know, what we are is we're different. We're very, very different. We fabricate ideas out of matter. No other creature does that. Some creatures fabricate genetic programming into matter. They build termite nests and honeycombs and coral reef but each those kinds of animals have incredibly limited repertoire and uh, it changes very very slowly under and it's not under conscious control we on the other hand you know can trade in our entire cultural model every six to eighteen months if we want uh, n this is never in a world the world is incredibly conservative and we are not. You know, the world will test a single modification on itself for 10,000 years before ruling yay or nay. We will generate, you know, 50 models of automobile in 40 years. Uh, uh, so, so we have gone from Christian generational times in 2,000 years to where we are now in a technological conscious awareness sense with the same biological capacity. Yes. Like our, our culture could have been played on the biology of 2,000 years ago. It definitely you know, could the, have. The programming that, that we're manifesting right now is, is a, a, a program that's running on a biological machine that, that is much, much older. And the hardware doesn't change, exactly. but the software changes. Exactly. I mean, in 1660, Newton invents the calculus. The software changes. In, in, in the 900s, in the Umayyad Caliphate of Baghdad, they invent algebra. You know, these are like system upgrades, right. is what they are. And in the 20th century, you know, incredibly powerful tools. In fact, tools so powerful that no single monkey understands or applies them. We have massively powerful technology, but it, it is also flawed conceptually. And Given a reasonable awareness and given the human consciousness is some channel for novelty, we can work on our technology if that's, what, if that's the direction that we choose to go. Well, we are the flexible part of technology. Yeah. Or Marshall McLuhan put it more graphically. He said, we are the genitals of our machines. <laughs> <coughs> we exist to make sure that next year's model is better. <laughs> You know? It's not very far off. Well, well, right now, for instance, when they design very densely packed circuitry, they tell the computer to optimize the packing, but they don't specify the final solution. The computer itself decides the final optimized close packing of the circuitry. It's very interesting that as the organic realm becomes more and more uninhabitable, we appear to be preparing a kind of an electronic trapdoor for ourselves, that uh, there is the possibility uh, some people like Hans Moravec and Frank Tipler and people like that think, you know, that we are destined to essentially become our machines. And uh, the, the projection of problems because of the fact that our material technology is so great, we may in fact project the, the problems to the point where they manifest themselves and, and become unmistakable. And that may be what spurs us to solve them in some sense or another. Well, primates love a good fight, and, and the fight hasn't begun yet. I mean, this is not the fight. This is the long garden party before the fight. I mean, uh, this is, you know, the groaning buffet tables, the literary conversation, uh, the women in the Thule dresses. Uh, but the fight will come, and, uh, and I, I have... I'm very interested in the human condition and in what we represent as a, an experiment of nature and an investment of nature. I mean, nature has put all life on this planet at risk for this experiment in self-reflection, intelligence, uh, uh, material downloading of ideas into matter. If there is an appetition for completion, as Alfred North Whitehead thought, then, you know, we have turned a corner in the high-stakes game of nature's uh, unfoldment. Just to hear you talk about
Well, I, I mean, certainly they have a right to live on the planet. I don't know where all that lies. Uh, 95% of all species that have ever existed on the planet are extinct. Nature is really an engine for the production of extinct species, apparently. At any given moment, only, you know, 5 to 7% are alive. There have been enormous diebacks in the past. Uh, ebb and flow of dieback is one way in which genetic or evolutionary advancement takes place because uh, it's in competition for... Uh, newly impoverished environments that speciation takes place. Like it's thought by most evolutionary biologists that before the rise of industrial civilization, the main force creating speciation among plants on this planet was the meandering of rivers because rivers produce in the course of meandering uh, sandbar environments and and uh, desertified coast, uh, bank regions, and it's into those wastelands that invader species can come, and that's where the the competition for new forms is most ferocious. In a climaxed ecosystem, uh, most mutations are lethal, but in a uh, in an open up for grabs environment like that, uh, mutations are not so frequently detrimental. That's the notion behind the evolution of weeds. What weeds are, are annual plants which produce enormous amounts of seed in a very opportunistic effort to uh, uh, grab and hold as much unclaimed territory as possible. In a climaxed rainforest, seeds are often huge, often produced uh, intermittently, and it's a whole different uh, uh, psychology of dispersal. Once human beings enter to the, into the scene with burning and land clearing and this sort of thing, then we become the major force affecting plant speciation. Unfortunately, this effect, both by meandering rivers and human beings, is to create a more, uh, uh, a less herbaceous, more annual, more ephemeral kind of uh, biotome. Carl Sauer, the geographer, said, we found the planet a climaxed forest and we will leave it a weedy lot. That's, that's what he meant about our impact on plant life. So this question, you know, about our place in, in the scheme of things versus all the rest of life, it's very clear that one of the unique things that is happening on the planet is that the fate of all life is becoming uh, hinged to the decisions made by a single species. It's though the concept of cultivation has at this point been extended to the entire planet and there's even a fairly radical form of political philosophy which would have you believe that we should take upon ourselves the role of caretaker of the planet and what that means is extending the umbrella of human responsibility over the entire biota. What it means then if you're an extraterrestrial standing off looking at all this is that what is really going on on the planet is a gene swarm and you know the concept of species is extremely slippery at its boundaries when you start trying to talk about it with a population geneticist or a molecular geneticist. And really what's happening is what, our, what the old biology calls species are really temporary nexus, nexi of genetic associations that on the scale of a million years are extremely plastic flowing, changing, and at the viral level, even mammalian genes are moving around. Everything is in flux. Well, so then, it, suspended at some position in this matrix to be determined by self-reflection, maybe, is our species, which has this peculiar role of extending control through the extension of metaphor and 
technology. And uh, we are uh, somehow now defining the process. And our, to this point, historical development has been unconscious. I mean, the notion of a global civilization is probably less than 30 years old. As a fact, it's less than 10 years old. The asymptotic rate at which boundaries are being dissolved and databases are being fused is uh, driving the historical process now with a momentum that no institution or person uh, can control the amount of information, the amount of uh, sheer data that's being connected up. I mean, I was thinking last night, for some reason, God knows why, uh, I was thinking about a, a, a pioneer in the Ohio Valley in 1810 uh, and how this guy could talk to his wife or his three children and how now at home uh, I can talk to probably 500 million people in the world fairly easily by simply placing an international telephone call. I can talk to that many people. 500 million, between 5 and 500 million is, I believe, six orders of magnitude of connection that has gone on. Well, it's astonishing. And it means that, uh, you know, we are running around basically with the reflexes best suited for bashing out the brains of reindeer. This is what we're best, this is what nature taught us to do. And meanwhile, this, this genie, which we have summoned out of, the, out of the dimensions of information and chaos and complexity that we have summoned through the magic of civilization, has some kind of autonomous existence, some kind of destiny. And it's not clear whether, um, you know, that organization is on some kind of quest for self-reflection and that it moves through the atomic, the molecular, the, the subcellular, the cellular, the organic, the cultural, the personal, if it's that kind of thing or if it's actually something that we have, as it were, summoned from above. I mean, this is back to these questions we talked about last night of Gnostic versus whatever else is out there in terms of defining how we think about our relationship to the other and how other we are. I mean, if nature is the standard, then we are clearly, you know, the minions of the other. Yeah. No, well, summoned in, this, in a sense of not so much dragged out, but ha triggered a descent of gnosis into our species. I mean, we have like summoned a genie, the genie of symbolic activity, cognitive understanding, mathematical representation. I mean, incredible tools uh, whose epistemic foundations are not clearly understood even by modern people. I mean, we do not know what numbers are, actually. And uh, yet, you know, we have these relationships to these things unquestioningly that give us, you know, the ability to, for instance, summon the light which burns at the heart of stars. We can summon that down to our deserts. And, well, it's a form of natural magic. I mean, it's eerie how, as natural magic abandoned its pretense of a moral universe in, at the close of the Thirty Years' War, it turned into modern science, which, you know, with cold gaze and a complete absence of any belief in spiritual hierarchy, began to work one by one the miracles you know, to summon the light which burns in the stars, to change lead into gold, to plumb the mysteries of life itself. But the price was a desouling. I mean, you don't have to be a Jungian to get to understand what the message here is. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the story of the golem. It, 
yes, it's Faustian. It's somehow that the price of this understanding is disensouling. The understanding comes, but the soul and the understanding cannot exist autonomously, which by a vicus mode of recirculation is sort of what I wanted to mention to, today. Well, yeah, I mean, one way t that I've always thought about biology is that, I mean, if you stand way off and look at biology, it's a kind of chemical uh, system for amplifying quantum mechanical indeterminacy. It's a, it's a way of lifting the indeterminacy at the atomic level and transferring it to the molecular level in the form of charge transfer, uh, resonance rings, uh, electron storage, and in, in this sort of thing, and then raising it still further into the, f the, the macrophysical realm so that concepts like free choice, indeterminacy, so forth and so on, become real. Because apparently, I mean obviously, uh, thoughts, which are the place where free will begins, I will or will not do X, thoughts are very subtly uh, channeled, ch I don't know if channeled is the word, uh, well, cascades of electrons. That, that what we're talking about when we say, you know, I will make my hand into a fist, and then it happens, is we're talking about thought becoming the initiator of physicality, of acts in the physical world. The, how this happens is completely unknown. Uh, but I think indeterminacy, free choice, the sense of uh, controllable destiny, all these things probably have to do with the fact that uh, the, the, the nature of living chemistry is quantum mechanical, and so it has these indeterminacies built into it. It's quite miraculous and yet very neat. Yes, right. And exploding in determinacy. I mean, that seems to be what, has, what is the magic of our existence, is that somehow we have pushed out a bubble of indeterminacy in a macrophysical space. I mean, people can say there is no free will, but there is the persistent experience of the illusion of free will, which is, you know, I'll take it. You know. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, how this happens, and it apparently uh, does, is not really, well, we don't know, obviously, but it is not obviously happening at the animal level in the same way it's happening for us. Animals experience a kind of eternal moment of choice-making, which also rides on this quantum indeterminacy, but they don't have a horizon of, of recall or a, or a set of forward-leading vectors based on the past, or at least it's assumed not. The fact that we can symbolically communicate these things is taken as proof of their presence in our organization and absence in other, or, yeah. What you're saying is that on the, on the atomic level is manifested in just into this, and that the expression of the, everything of the expression of the atomic level is kind of a mechanism that's expressed through it? Into this well, the way nature seems to work in most systems is that it, um, a strategy which works will be repeated on different levels at different scales. This is the fractal thing that we were talking about over here. Um, so uh, it, it's a great question. See, if there is not free will, then thinking is meaningless. Because if there is not free will, you think what you think because you couldn't possibly think anything else. So thinking is not an enterprise of any consequence in a universe without free will. Yet we have the persistent intuition that thinking is of consequence. Well, so then the question is, our science tells us that at the scale we're living at, Everything is very highly determined by, like, thermodynamics, Newtonian physics, uh, the laws of mechanics, so forth and so on. 
and, and that we are, I mean, this is where Descartes pushed it in this 18th century, that we are machines of some sort. Yet, you know, persistently, modernity insists that there is this existential residuum. Well, then, if you're going to try and explain explain it, you know, whatever that means, in scientific terms, then what you have to do is find a source of this kind of indeterminacy somewhere in the universe and then build a pipeline, an ideological pipeline, where you can pipe it from there to where you need it. Okay, so where we need it is in modern sociology and psychology, and where we have it is in quantum physics. So a lot of people are trying to build a pipeline to bring it over here and dump it here, and then it will do wonderful things for our modeling of the living state. But I, I you know, this is all fine to talk about this, but I warn you, this is not my forte nor my favorite thing, because I think it's very cut off from uh, the felt presence of immediate experience. Well, that's, that's what's missing from all that, that, we're, that we've been kind of tap-dancing around this, since we started this discussion about what is our relationship with nature and the earth. I mean, in a way, maybe it's just such an obvious thing. Everybody here just already thinks this, and nobody wants to say it. But, I mean, I think it's obvious that human beings are in some kind of unique situation on the Earth, either by design or their own will or something. But we still have the sticky problem of what to do about we're here on the Earth now with the animals and the plants, and in a way, isn't this... Uh, the de soul uh, condition that we're in, isn't that what really you're, a lot of what you're interested in is supposed to address? I mean, isn't that what psychedelics are supposed to address? What is our relationship with nature? And it's sort of something that you just need to, we need to re get, we have to get back in touch with that in some real immediate way that we don't have to think about almost or, or philosophize about, but we just are a part of this matrix. And then we can really figure out where we go with our, with this, in this Faustian pact that we've made and so forth. Do we go to the stars and so forth? But I don't think we're going anywhere until we get this relationship figured out with what to do with the earth and nature, our relationship with it. Well, on one level, it's an act of attention. It's not like an ideology. It's simply a, a shift of attention so that we watch it. On an, I mean, your question is broad. It ranges from, you know, the most practical questions of population politics, demography, insurance and tax policies, this kind of thing, to, uh, you know, the basically how shall we design the destiny of the race kind of questions. Probably every civilization that has gone through a twilight has had groups of concerned, uh, comfortable people who have met in rooms to decry the approaching catastrophe. You know, I'm sure that at, when Rome <laughs> fell, there were people who said, you know, we see what it is, the bad tax policies, the barbarians at the border, these religious cults, uh, it's just, it's not safe to walk the streets anymore. Uh, and yet fell, she did. <laughs> and this always happens. So I, I, don't, I don't know. It bothers me to think that we could perhaps trigger... See, what's f most fragile is democratic values. And I'm pretty confident that the human race is going to survive in some form or another. But all we have to do is hit one speed bump and democratic values, which are already under tremendous assault, will just go down the drain. Uh, you, you must have all seen a few weeks ago in the New York Times the article about how FAO or somebody issued this report that the world food supply has now fallen behind the world food demand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this long demographic article littered with equations and statistics, but what it's saying is, million, you know, build into your model of the world millions of people starving every year in various places as politicians manipulate and move food supplies around because forced agriculture is failing around the world and so forth and so on. When, when does it become moral, for example, for, for governments to, say, pay women not to have children? 
mean, th this is the... It's a moot point, tried. because you have... Uh, you what do you mean they've already tried? Yeah. In, in Singapore, sure. they have, yes. Yeah. They, they had tax advantages. Yes, well, mostly what they try in Singapore, they succeed with. But Singapore is a perfect <laughs> example. Singapore is a beige fascism. Well, and, you know, they like don't burn books and <laughs> wear funny uniforms, but the, the result is the same. I mean... Well, but right now, we're quite literally paying people to have children in a tax incentive government structure, uh, you know, church sponsored. I mean, that is the posture of our civilization at the no, moment. No, no, only America. Is we are but see, you would have to refight the wars of the 17th century because what you would have to do is say no social institution, period, can promulgate policies which are genocidal or racially suicidal. And then you would have to arrest the Pope and to proceed along those lines and <laughs> what that's coming up on the time wave in the enlightenment <laughs> arresting the pope <laughs> well you heard it here first folks the, the cultural thing that's happening there is interesting the internet is becoming the network i mean there is a globalization of of a single computer network and, and so what do you say to people who ask the simple question, what if it's evil? <laughs> we don't have a choice. <laughs> we don't have a choice. <laughs> what a great answer to that question. <laughs> the only possible answer to that question. <laughs> You know, but the concept of psychedelic awareness is not. I mean, we can be quite conscious of the process, but the idea that we can, that we, I, me, can individually manifest a significant difference to it by choice is an ego. Well, process. but that, that's and an I, interesting it's question. It's the so the, fact, that you, the fact that you can't do it, the fact that you can't affect that dimension may mean that that's not the dimension you should be trying to affect. In other words, um, part of what's going on, I think, is a retreat to immediacy. Uh, I will next week uh, get on the Internet, but I found your question amusing because I loathe people who ask if you're on the Internet. I went through this with fax machines six years ago, and finally the whining just reached <laughs> such a level. They said, all right we will get the dedicated fax line. And yes, next week we will be on the internet, but with no sense of joy. With, uh, and since we have no choice, as you inform me, uh, what difference does it matter whether I like it or don't like it? It just has to be done. I have observation. The thing is, it seems like as more complex the communication network, as more trivial is most of the communication. Well, but isn't but that doesn't That's mean that there isn't also a rising percentage of profound communication. I mean, yes, when everything is being communicated, 99% of it will be garbage. Nevertheless, when everything is communicated, 100% of the good stuff will be being communicated. We just need more good stuff. Huh? We just need more good stuff. Well, what we need are filters and navigational devices and... Uh, who's, who's going to sort out the 1% we need? Well, you're going to buy software that is tailored to your needs or not tailored to your needs, depending on whether you're a chump or not. That's the thing. I mean, I don't have the capacity to sort it out. To, to well, then the you're chance. dead on arrival. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new order. No choice. Yeah, no choice. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it was, right? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Go for it. Okay. We don't. We didn't uh, grow our own brains as human beings. So maybe we're not growing our own global brain. Yeah. The point about all this is, and the only reason there is any hope, is because this, these, the macro process that's going on is not under the control of human planners or institutions. Thank God. If it were, it would be as big a botch as everything else. But it is not under the control of human planners and institutions. It is biological, not cultural. 
th this is what has not been understood about history, is that, you know, the past million years, the big headlines have, have been biological and, organ and uh, behavioral slash organizational. The software, which is languages, religions, cultures, systems of magic, mathematics, engineering schemas, heresies, magic, so forth. Well, all that is uh, ephemeral. And there hasn't been a major shift in behavior slash organization since the rise of uh, perspective. But that's only five, six hundred years in the past. Now, something else is happening. And the sensory biases and technological biases that permitted uh, the evolution of the post-medieval democratic individual, the citizen, the worker, uh, uh, taxpayer. taxpayer, all that is now the field of focus is moving beyond it. Something else is happening. Everything is being recast. And we, each of us, as we imbibe the medium of the culture, keep trying on the latest adumbration of modernity that is consistent with what we can put up with. You know, so so-and-so decides to have reconstructive cosmetic surgery. Somebody else decides not to. Somebody else decides they'll go with the tattoo, but not the nipple piercing. Somebody else decides, you know, Armani is okay, Gucci is out. What this is, is, you know, shedding and scaling of cultural self-image controlled by the individual in a relationship of capital expenditure to monolithic images that are being projected down through the sociological control mechanism. So all, the, all the means are there in the matrix of information between human beings, or they're being put, put in place anyway. So that's fine and good, but what's not, and what hasn't happened yet is we haven't been resold. That's or, right. Since, we've been diesel, that's what we've got to get. Well, to. We see, there is no percentage now in educating us because as marks, which is what we all are, we are easier to manipulate, easier to fleece. You know, it's easier to get an idiot to join a book club than it is to get an intelligent person to join a book club. This is an interesting equation then for the American publishing industry, you see and uh, all other of these voluntary participations in the market economy. So it's about uh, reclaiming immediate experience and retracting fetishism, which relates to addiction and all this other stuff, because what's happened is a social system, a virus, has gotten loose that is actually uh, not symbiotic, but ultimately will kill off the, uh, the host, and we are the host. I mean, you know, Lenin said when it comes time to hang the capitalists, they'll sell us new rope. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this is true. They're, Lenin's gone, but we are still, you know, digging the ground from beneath our feet uh, because uh, of this object fetishism, which is a form of addiction which comes out of, you know, our dysfunctional relationship to our prehistory. I think so. And then there are two ways to approach doing something about it. One, to go cold turkey, to try and just cure it by, I suppose, psychedelic drugs and massive applications of, of a different point of view, or to try and mediate it by analyzing, this would be the methadone approach, uh, to, to try and figure out, you know, what is it about this fetishism and how much of it can be satisfied without killing ourselves. And this is where you get the virtual reality uh, enthusiasts because they're saying, you know, object fetishism is not detrimental to the earth if the objects are made of light. In other words, the problem is the physicality of the fetish itself. Mm -hmm. If you can make the fetish out of light, well, in a sense, we have this, though. We have hundreds of millions of people being warehoused by television. 
where they live, you know, toxic, low-awareness lives, semi-preserved by food preservatives and low levels of ionizing radiation, and they live in great uh, uh, arcologies where everybody is tuned to a different... Uh, yes. Well, on the other hand, do you want these people driving around and crowding the malls and waiting in lines in front of you in restaurants? If all these people ever... Walking down virtual shopping malls, exactly. So, uh, I don't know. It's a great age for intelligence because there's so little of it. Uh, the, the, the nature of the game is to, uh, to deprogram from all of these systems of images that are being handed down. And then, you know, to make your way like a pilgrim with eyes open across a new landscape, which is not a very pretty landscape because, you know, Western civilization is in the act of a slow-motion train wreck. That's what's going on at the end of, uh, of the millennium. Because, you know, what do you want to do? What's the alternative? Well, the, the only alternative I've found is to yak about it and to, you know, a kind of Hasidic complaining is good. And, and just never shut up. What's happening now is uh, there is so much understanding running around at the service of capitalism, but it's all micromanaged. Somebody has a technology for making a better chip. Somebody has a better, faster switch. But nobody can extrapolate what is the consequence of all of this stuff at once. And it has, there are emergent properties so that no one can actually predict the direction that the culture is moving in. And the cone of projection is actually shortening, not lengthening, as uncertainty is crowding into the system as more and more factors begin to arrive. I mean, we don't know where it could come from. It could come from superconductivity or cold fusion or charge transfer or, you know, and at any moment some technology, technique or piece of information could arrive which will just confound the entire situation. I think that psychedelics are this, that, that you know, what the what physics was for the 20th century, pharmacology and psychedelic uh, travel or whatever will be for however much of the 21st century exists before we're sucked into the infundibulum. Because uh, <clears throat> it is, at, at last, we have understood. See, I mean, the way science proceeds, which is somewhat reasonable, is by dealing with the simple questions first. You know, what is a falling ball? Uh, you know, what is an inclined plane? Simple questions first. Now, uh, reductionism has essentially come to the end of its road with matter. The canceling of the superconducting, super collider. Did you read the descriptions of how to go to the level where they could test the theory they would need a superconducting super collider a thousand kilometers around and then to go to the next order of magnitude to test the final level of the theory a superconducting super collider the size of the solar system well these things are not going to be built so what it means is that this this path proceeding from the Greeks for 2,500 years has now come to an end with a handful of quarks. You know, that's, that's what you've got. And, you know, mountains of equation and many careers and all those conferences in Zurich and in Italy and chasing women around in Stockholm and all that business, that happened. Uh, what's now, it's understood that the really interesting energies go on at probably less than that of an ordinary AAA flashlight battery, and that everything goes on uh, in, the near, in the near domain, specifically the biology of this planet, even more pointedly, the neocortex of the higher primate man. This is where the action is. And the, it, science is possible in the neocortex, but it's much more like shamanism because it's a phenomenological science, meaning it bases itself on observation 
like 19th century botany or something, and what you send is simply the intelligent mind. You know, it's not about long base interferometry, radio telescopes, and all these instrumentalities. The instrumentality of psychopharmacology lies in the laboratory, but the field work of psychopharmacology lies, you know, right here. And I, uh, you know, I made it my business to attend to what has been accomplished by the Western mind. And then I made it my business to explore the, some of the wilder frontiers of pharmacology. And uh, the news I bring back to the best of my ability is that great confoundment lies ahead. I mean, you can run those wild horses over that cliff any time. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a moot point as to whether Western science can survive the encounter with these things. And, you know, it's only been about a hundred years Louis Lewin went to Cincinnati and brought peyote back to Berlin in 1888 and began his extraction processes. It's been a hundred years that this peculiar ethnological complex of the aboriginal people at the fringes of great civilizations has been deposited on our plate. And for most of that time, it's either been ignored or illegal or both. And so we don't, we have not finished with this. And people like ourselves, what we represent is an intuitionally driven underground of people who have found this to have some positive or fascinating impact on our own lives. But we are uh, not an ideology or a field of study. I mean, some of us are simply thrill seekers. Some of us are pharmacologists, some of us ethnologists, some botanists, psychologists, artists. Everybody has a different angle, but the thing has not annealed into a coherent understanding. The, the self, the ego, is the crowning achievement of Western civilization. It also is sinking the rowboat and <laughs> What this stuff represents is an antidote, but this is a cultural war of such fierceness and fury because, uh, you know, people are going to be mighty agitated when they realize how, what cultural transformation really means. It means you can't take it with you. It means you can't take you with you. And, uh, you know, that, that the issue of surrender in a dominator society is very major. That's why these psychedelics are so politically hot. Because, you know, the, the ego, for all of its bluster, is a very fragilely established thing. Mm -hmm. And every wind that blows carries a certain threat to it. And, <laughs> well, the, if you fully assimilate the time wave theory, I think the part that colors immediate experience is the resonances. Uh, because it's sort of hard to explain, but uh, for instance, in James Joyce's Ulysses, the way he organizes it is on one level, this is a book about a guy trying to buy some kidneys to fry for breakfast and wandering around his neighborhood waiting for the meat store to open and having all these things go on. On one level, it's that. On another level, it's the Trojan War and the peregrinations of Odysseus in the Eastern Mediterranean. And then there are several other levels. Well, everything gives off vibrations of its metaphorical or analogical relationship to similar situations in the past. This is a kind of literalizing of the Sheldrakean morphogenetic field. So mm -hmm. let's take an, an obvious and easy example. A person, any person, mm -hmm. uh, their face, their gesture is an, obviously a resonance of their grandfather, their great-grandmother, their son. All of these genetic concatenations are coming together. We understand that because it's a material metaphor and relational. But everybody 
I don't really believe in reincarnation in the ordinary sense, but I do believe that we are interference patterns mm. of effects created by people who existed in the past and the future. Mm. And you can see it. You know, I see a lot of people, and uh, I th at least I think I do. Sometimes I think it's just the same 250 being moved ahead of me on the trucks <laughs> at night. <clears throat> But I'm not sure. Uh, but, but people give off these resonances of past time, and situations give them off. Uh, uh, you know, cities. I mean, it's not so true in America where everything is young, but in Europe, if you know where you are, then you usually know several things scattered along a time chain about where you are, you know, what was going on in the 4th century, the 9th century, the 16th, and the 19th. And uh, the, this, this is a way of seeing. I mean, this is really there. This is in everything. This is just an extension of intuition where you actually see a wider spectrum of time in people, in their faces. Uh, uh, one thing that the time wave says is that there are um, clots of of novelty in a other in a medium of otherwise less novel stuff of some sort, a probabilistic medium, and a person, a galaxy, a person, uh, a book, are nexes of novelty floating along in this less novel medium, and these things come together and go apart, uh, but specifically people are persistent nexi of, of novelty. And obviously there is a boundary of complexity at my skin surface. I mean, an inch in, it's a very different place than an inch out, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had read an article recently um, that talked about how the vocabulary of um, say like a 14 year old today has decreased significantly in the last 30 years to the point of like they were saying uh, today I think this is about the average 14 year old has a vocabulary of about 10,000 words as a, opposed to 20, about 26,000 words about 30 years ago and I was wondering um, what your thoughts were about that if you thought it was a manifestation of we're moving into this realm of being able to communicate better without actually having to verbalize these things or are we moving toward the 1984 uh, ver version of, of hell where well, we're cutting the, back on our the problem is, is that we're, m we're moving in both directions at once I mean it's a What's happening is that the society is beginning to stretch its upper and lower boundaries. Mm -hmm. You can now fall farther and climb higher than you ever could before. I mean, if you screw up in this society, you could find yourself living under a bridge uh, quickly. If, on the other hand, you know, the dice rolled a different way for you, you know, you could be sleeping with Madonna tomorrow. <laughs> 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 